Okay, today is uh, under the spotlight. Uh, our guest is Lambert Heller. Lambert uh, comes from Germany. He is the head of the Open Science Lab at the TIB in Hannover. Uh, he has been educated as a sociologist, but he also studied library and information science. Um, as a sociologist, uh, he is a real community builder. Uh, for instance, he initiated cultural data hackathons. Um, but um, he is also a human, so he likes TV series, um, Mediterranean, uh, kitchen, good coffee, and maybe a good beer. <laughs> but he will tell you all about that. Okay, the floor is yours, Lambert. Thank you so much for the nice introduction with the human touch, Monique. I'm very happy to share uh, with you today about our experiences with coding Da Vinci and other hackathon like approaches. And I will have a few. Um, slides about that give me a second please <clears throat> uh, no ah, i cannot share i'm not allowed to share uh, maybe you have to switch my role um, so zoom tells me the host has deactivated now it's working thanks a lot so i hope this works for you. Yeah, should you should see um, the slides, first slide now. Okay, so what I want to tell you is our experience with uh, running a coding Da Vinci open cultural data hackathon. Uh, it's now almost two years ago. And also um, similar other activities happening at our library TIB. But uh, at the very beginning, I would very quickly and shortly um, tell you a little bit about the place I work here, and what this is, what we do in general. So uh, it's called TIB, Leibniz Information Center for Science and Technology. It's in Northwestern Germany, and it's uh, one of the larger research libraries uh, in uh, Germany, one could say. So we are part of the Leibniz Association, and uh, we are at the same time, we, so we are a research institution on our own, but we are also um, a University of Hannover's university library. So, and uh, so uh, we have many people working here. We have a pretty large, uh, as you can imagine, research and development department. And within that department, we have those about 20, 25 people now working in my uh, open science lab. So, and I want today share one of the yeah, activities that is very close to our heart here at OSL and that connects to many other research and <coughs> development project projects that we have here. So we had a lot, lot, lot of funded project, European as well as national and so on. But this is something that uh, in a way connects to many of these activities that we do at Open Science Lab and at TIB in general. And um, this is not to say that this is the only open related uh, thing happening at TIB, far from it. So have a closer look. We have, for instance, the AV portal, which is a video portal for um, all kinds of video lectures, uh, open, openly accessible educational videos, and so on. We have the open research knowledge graph <clears throat> led by Søren Auer, uh, which is an um, approach to have um, <clears throat> research information in a more meaningful digital way than in, um, uh, within PDFs. We have, um, this is also part of my team here, Open Science Lab, Vivo, we made Vivo, um, popular in Germany and in other European countries, which was mostly a, an <clears throat> American or uh, English <laughs> thing, so to say, uh, which is um, yeah, a piece of open research information infrastructure and so on. So you have lots of open aspects in DIB, at DIB in general. Yeah, okay, but now let's focus on the funny, interesting hackathon thing with coding Da Vinci. 
So uh, first things first, we had, a, I, I have to make sure that this get not in the way of my presentation slide. So, uh, so uh, we, we did our first coding Da Vinci hackathon in 2020. And uh, you must know that in Germany, and maybe also uh, it's even now um, well known across uh, German borders, I guess, we have um, uh, had many coding Da Vinci hackathons so far. And the next two or three slides that I share are more or less taken from Philippe Genet, who is sitting at the German National Library in Frankfurt, and for several years now is coordinating these coding Da Vinci hackathons, and uh, at the and towards the end of, of my presentation, I will also show him his contact detail. So he is super knowledgeable about this um, uh, approach of coding Da Vinci in particular. So, and what 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 these coding Da Vinci hackathons have really in common is the idea of um, making. Uh, data from cultural institutions, from the whole spectrum, libraries, but as well museums, galleries, you name it, memorial institutions and so on, uh, to make them open. And um, there's a special approach about uh, coding Da Vinci, which is um, you, you learn about the value of openness by playing around with data. And at the same time, you co-create the future of um, culture, uh, as it is meaningful in the internet age and in the digital age. So this is a lot about um, having super meaningful, super necessary discussions with cultural heritage institutions, where you make sure they understand why it is important, why it is feasible, and why it is important for themselves to share their data. And as you know, it this is a long process, and we are almost, I, I don't know where we stand exactly now, but uh, we, 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 will have, uh, we will have many years to come where we have these kind of discussions. And um, so a hackathon comes up with um, new applications of data and new ideas, creative ideas, what can be made with data. And ultimately, it's a bridge between different communities because you have on the one hand cultural heritage institutions, and you have on the other hand, you name it, game developers, library software developers, creative peoples, uh, people of all kinds. Yeah, so the full spectrum. Um, and um, a hackathon is um, an event essentially where they all come together and group around open data and play, play with it. So and uh, the coding Da Vinci branded hackathon, so to say, um, follow always almost the same playbook. You have a kickoff event, and this is pretty common for, for hackathons in general. You will observe this pattern in other hackathons as well. So in the um, uh, like 15 or 20 years ago, originally this came out of the IT industry, and you have uh, a lot of these patterns there as well, but without the open aspect. Uh, this is an important point. Uh, I will come back to this later. And so, so you have a kickoff event where you have, uh, uh, if by any means possible, as an on-site event, we had the very, very harsh situation of having to do this as an online event, and it's not the same thing. So mostly you should try to have a, a weekend where you invite everybody who's interested in this um, to come on site and gather on site. And then you have um, uh, uh, the opportunity for cultural heritage institu institutions to give a very quick pitch about the data set that they share. And that they, they do this not only for this one weekend, but they, they commit to, to open these data sets on the long run. This is, this is important about coding Da Vinci. And then you have a couple of weeks time for the participants to develop ideas and to gather a small project groups that try to build a prototype, do something funny, interesting, unexpected with the data. This can be an app, but this can also be a physical thing where you, uh, what do I know, 3D print something from a data set, whatever. And then towards the end, and this is an incentive thing, you know, this is important too. You have an award ceremony where a jury of uh, experts from 
both from all sectors, um, come up with a few winner projects that uh, are given the opportunity. Some of them uh, are incentivized to uh, continue to work on their prototypes. So, for instance, they, they get additional small amounts of money in order to, to, to um, continue the work on their projects. And um, often it happens that, that cultural heritage institutions, which were picked by project teams, where project teams decided, oh, that looks interesting, we will do something with them, that they come back later to these creators and really make use with them and collaborate with them, right? This happens sometimes. And um, uh, the open, not on, it's not only the data sets that are openly available, but this is an important part of the spirit of coding Da Vinci. All of the outcomes, so all of the project results are also openly licensed. So it's a fully open event, so to say. And uh, by the way, if you have in the meantime, any kind of questions or so, we have a lot of time after my presentation to come back to this. Maybe you just uh, put it in the chat here, in the Zoom chat or so. Uh, maybe that's the easiest way. Yeah, okay. I, I, I see a nod by Paola, so yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so let's have a closer look very concretely at our coding Da Vinci. So we had, although this was only an online event, more than 100 participants at the kickoff event we had, and this was, uh, I guess, a um, uh, uh, number that was not reached by any uh, coding Da Vinci hackathon before, we had 37 cultural institutions from all of Niedersachsen, so this is our federal state of Germany here that we uh, convinced somehow uh, to donate <laughs> data sets to the hackathon event. So we ended up with 44 data sets. They are still all stored on the Coding Da Vinci website, sometimes also in other places. And they are all openly licensed. They are completely different. You will find completely different things like 3D photography of beetles from a natural history museum, but also digitized pictures of maps, of historic maps from um, um, archival uh, library here in Hanover. And um, we had nine finished projects, but I think really, and I'm, I'm serious about this, I, I, I think the, the, the most um, uh, valuable outcome of these kinds of events is intangible, and that is experiences that are being made, because you learn about what it means to have um, did, also things in the cult, in the digital space as a cultural institution, and, and you learn what, what they have, what these institutions have, what they have to share, and um, also super important, you learn about new ways to learn and to work in a hackathon. And yeah, have a look at the, at the illustrated final report made by my colleague Gabi Fahrenkrog here at TRB. And um, so I, I want to uh, quickly um, put your attention to one of the, um, maybe uh, at the end of the session, we have a little more, bit more time to explore this, uh, or at least ha have a look at this website um, on your own. Uh, they have a five minute or so um, video on YouTube where they um, make this tangible, what this outcome was, and really have a look at it. I can recommend it. So what they did here, so there's a very traditional, very old library in Niedersachsen, the Herzog Arch, Arch August Library, Herzog August Bibliothek in Wolfenbüttel. And um, this has um, a book wheel. <laughs> that was an instrument that was used back then in the 16th century, where you had uh, the library catalog and uh, other um, important uh, books uh, on a wheel so that you could, uh, can, could uh, quickly, relative, quickly um, switch between the books and, and uh, turn that wheel and then uh, browse through these books. And what they did was uh, they um, created a uh, um, uh, development backend for computer games. Um, 
a thing uh, where they reproduced the wheel, took digitized versions of those valuable books and made it in a way that you can um, have a VR with, with, with a VR headset and VR things on your fingers where you can browse through the books without having to click any buttons or joysticks or controls. But it's almost like you do everything with your fingers like in the real world. And this is uh, uniquely and interesting because it comes close to this holodeck for, for the Star Trek fans that are certainly here. Uh, it's almost the holodeck version of um, having the, the real experience of using that book wheel, which is I mean, you can, yeah, okay, sure, you can use, the, you can see the book wheel, but you cannot really use it, right? So this is not, not possible because it's very, very old and fragile, but in this um, uh, computer game world, you can. And uh, so this is only one, I, 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 uh, it was important for me to at least have a closer look at one of these amazing projects that came out of our hackathon. And this one uh, won also the Everybody's Darling Award. <laughs> and uh, yeah, okay, let's, uh, let's have a um, further look. So uh, um, by now I told you something about the coding Da Vinci approach of uh, cultural data hackathons. Um, but this, for, for us, this was two years ago, and that was super interesting. We learned a lot. And also we learned to value this because this was such an important networking event for us. And we learned together about these playful approaches and um, what it is like to come out in a very uh, compressed matter of time um, to find out uh, uh, about the, uh, these data sets and what they are and what can be done with them. And um, so we took this inspiration and came up with new projects. So there was this project that was already running at our place, uh, uh, the Gestapo Terror Places, where we have an interactive uh, digital map um, where uh, you can see what during the Nazi regime time in Germany was being done in today's Lower Saxony and today, uh, today our modern region of Germany. And um, we, we, we took the results or the intermediary results of these projects and came up with an entirely new project named Remember Me. And Remember Me is about allowing young people to participate in this project. So we, we explained to them, for instance, students at uh, University of Hanover Applied Science, um, where Ina Blümel, another leader of uh, Open Science Lab at TIB, is teaching as a professor. Uh, we, we took their students and um, explored with them how you can connect data sets from, for instance, the authority for monuments in Lower Saxony with uh, existing uh, data from Wikimedia Commons and Wikidata. And we explored this with them and uh, we created a, even a manual for, for younger people to do this on your own. And um, we connected data and uh, made, made the data more valuable and uh, came up with new additional information that could be added and so on. And uh, so, so in, in a way, it's, it's, it's not exactly a hackathon, but it, it takes um, some of the approach, right? Because th so this is all about not, not um, uh, introduce people to the abstract concept of things, but allowing them to do uh, things that they find interesting and just help them and uh, facilitate them explain the necessary tools or, or uh, details that they need to know about the data and uh, to take this uh, action-oriented approach, so to say. And you could also call it action learning, I guess. And uh, so, so, so ac action learning is, is, is different from, from the normal university project that you would have for students and that it is part of um, official like um, project, a funded project where you expect a serious outcome. So this is not only um, working of students or of young people for, okay, I, in, the, in the end, I will get some degree or some uh, grade from this, but it's uh, for real, so to say, what, what they produce there. 
uh, yeah, okay. And um, we also are about to prepare another um, data hackathon. This time it will focus around uh, 3D data, but from different domains. So the interesting twist here is that we, uh, this uh, takes also a lot of inspiration from Coding Da Vinci for sure, but this will be organized by the um, NFDIs, which is the National um, uh, Research Data Infrastructure, which uh, Germany came up with two years ago or so, and which we are part of. And uh, if, if you think about it, so, so uh, cultural data like um, um, material and immaterial cultural heritage data and so on, and biodiversity data, this has next to nothing in common, you would guess, right? But that what they have in common, amongst others, um, maybe, is that they care about um, uh, establishing good practices around data, and especially around open data. And they also have in common that uh, 3D data, data sets um, are there and are valuable in, in different aspects. And the idea is to have a, a cross-pollination where you uh, can imagine easily someone working uh, in a museum on 3D data sets and for the first time maybe uh, in a very quick and comprehensible way learn about specific methods that are used in biology for their 3D data. And this is the kind of thing yet that you want to have at a hackathon. So there's not not very much pre-planned, but you have, um, uh, for starters, half a day of workshops where you can instantly, if you want to, if, if you have enough motivation, where you can instantly um, get to learn some interesting new approach or some new tool about 3D. And uh, yeah, and also I forgot to mention, it's not only NFDIs, National Research Data Infrastructures, but it's also AG3D, which is a loose but very well established network in Germany of researchers from all areas um, uh, who do work and do share 3D data. And um, I, I think this, this is important because, uh, I mean, the, the, the focus with Coding Da Vinci is always uh, you can have um, different audiences and bring them together. You have, a, you have this bridge between them. Um, and I guess this is also true and very, very valuable. Maybe we, have, we will have to try um, <laughs> within uh, research as well, yeah? because um, as research is growing and uh, computational practices, practices with 3D printing and so on are growing and become more and more complex. Nobody can be an expert on all of them since, since a long time already, as you know. Um, it becomes more interesting to play with people from different fields and together around something that you have in common. So this is a basic idea here. Yeah, and uh, one last thing that I would like to mention, this is not exactly a hackathon, but in some way, yeah, it's same but different. And this is book spreads. So we have this approach uh, cultivated for many years now at TIB Open Science Lab, that we have projects where we invite uh, people as uh, experts from a very specific field, uh, together physically for just a few days, for three to five days or so, and to write a book from scratch, like a textbook or a manual or a field guide. And this is something that we did repeatedly, and it's surprisingly interesting and good experience. So here in this case, we share patterns that uh, are maybe known for, from you also from uh, Wikipedia. So uh, we have this concept of collective ownership and everything is open from the get grow go and also the result. And uh, it's always surprising that uh, if you have a facilitator who guides you through the process, you can uh, come up with a highly consistent, high level uh, resource material educational resource um, at the end of these three to five days or so. This is what we call book sprints. 
And um, yeah, okay, this, uh, have a look for yourself at uh, tip.eu uh, slash books. You, you, you find more about these approaches. And this is also maybe one last aspect that I would like to, to uh, mention, um, to see that there's open software that helps you doing this and that there are open methods for doing this collaboratively. Um, this is also what JISC in the UK once called digital capability building. Yeah? Once you participated in such a book sprint, this is very pretty much the same, I guess, as with, with hackathons, you learned a lot because you, you um, will be more, much more confident about what you can do on your own. Yeah? So, so you have these um, approaches of uh, self-organized working on a common goal with open resources with other experts from your field. So, and this is mostly what I uh, uh, would like to share with you. And uh, yeah, okay, this is the semi-last slide I also want to share, but I will, uh, while uh, we can share the whole slide deck with you. So um, don't mind, you need to take, you do not need to take notes now. So, but this is also the contact data of Philip Genie. I already mentioned him, who's project coordinator of Coding Da Vinci. And also again, my uh, contact detail here. And I would really like to love to know about what you, what you do with hackathons, what you expect from them, what you can imagine maybe to do with them, um, or with booksprints. <laughs> and uh, of course you can ask me any question. So it's an AMA, ask me anything <laughs> kind of event here, I guess. And uh, yeah, that, that's all for now. I will stop sharing my screen now. Oh, how do I do this? So, okay. Now I give back to Monique. Yes, thank you, Lambert. That was an interesting story. And um, all the cool things like um, hackathons, <laughs> book sprints, uh, 3D printing. I, I, wow, I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We are neighbors, our, our countries, but I didn't know uh, such cool things happened um, in the neighborhood <laughs> in Nieder Saxon. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I wondered um, the book sprints, uh, are they also organized for students? Uh, I, I didn't know if there were just researchers on, on the slide or also students. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I, I, uh, I have been asked this uh, many times, so, so um, very honest answer, this is mostly not for students, the, the book sprints, the book sprints in particular, not the hackathons, because um, the, with the book sprint, you normally uh, have as a target group, so to say, a group of experts who share a common knowledge about their specific field and to, who are most often also used to explain things to others and uh, yeah. who, who are some somehow um, uh, pa pa part part of knowledge transfer activities activities like teaching and so on and uh, this makes things a lot easier this is not to say that if you are a teacher you can maybe use some of the approaches and methods in your teaching but this is not a uh, what, what our book sprints uh, focus on normally. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I can understand it. It would take um, uh, too much time, I think, if you just <laughs> do this with uh, students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but, 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 but from the other, you can also see this from the other side. So uh, in 2018, we did this um, Foster Open Science Training Handbook book sprint, which was part of a European project. And uh, this uh, book, uh, which is still out there and by now translated in many languages, um, has been used in uh, open science boot camps and training events, where then uh, again, um, students and early career researchers and so on made use of it and also annotated it and helped helped us to find out uh, where it maybe lacks or what 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 needs additional explanation and stuff like this. Okay, yeah, yeah, that, that's interesting. Uh, mm. that, that could be uh, very helpful. Yeah, and PhDs 
Okay, they're, they're researchers. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I, I think there are more questions I can uh, imagine. Can I go, Monique? Yes, of course. Oh, thanks. That's great. So, uh, Lambert, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, uh, there were a number of things that you you said that really um, hit home to me about. Um, so I know with hackathons you're often working towards a specific goal and there's a competition and there's an energy in the room. Um, and as you say, you know, getting people together live is like is really ideal, but you know, uh, it's not always possible as we know. But you also said that the intangible is also really crucial and it really is. Um, so it doesn't always have to be tangible or that you have a concrete service that that is then uh, developed. Sometimes it, uh, with my experience, you know, you don't quite get there, but still you have the new connections, you've got the collaboration between different sectors, which I think is really exciting. Um, so thank you for telling us about that. Uh, something I was curious about um, was, of course, Hackathons are often traditionally you're using data, right? And you're getting lots of different uh, disciplines attacking the data and creating something valuable from that. Um, and, and then you also talked about the book sprints. So that's like a, a collaborative effort on, on, a, on a document. So I'm kind of wondering for open education, um, how could we apply this best? And you did mention that perhaps we could create an OER together. I think that sounds like a really great idea. And of course, you know, that's like a very wide topic. We could go all sorts of places, right? Thinking about what that OER might do. Uh, is it for us? Is it for our uh, students? Is it for our teachers? You know, um, so I was also curious, uh, um, what you might like to do applying. So you have a team with open science, you have a lab, which is also very unique and very uh, prestigious, I know, in the European context, the work that you're doing there, but how could we bring some of that expertise um, and connect it with open education for the good of open education. And I'm wondering, I know you came in, you came to the, the group uh, reasonably recently. So you must have some 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 ideas yourself why you're here with us and and what you would like to get out of it. And maybe there maybe you have an idea of how we might apply this this uh, method for the good of open education. I would love to hear a bit more. Thanks. Thanks for the super interesting question, Vanessa. So uh, just as a side note, but this is more like an anecdote also. More than 10 years ago or so, we had uh, the first event at TIB uh, where we really announced it as an event about OER. And I guess back then the term OER was, I mean, it was hard, hard to be found on Twitter or some, something. Back then, uh, yeah, by the way, this was an event where we invited Christian Spannagel, who was also one of the mat mathematics professors here from Germany, who was a pioneer in this. And he did a, a class on switch classroom approaches and OER. That was very fun. Now, okay, but um, to, to, to address your, your real question. So I can tell you uh, the playbook of creating successfully an OER with book sprints. Um, and uh, so my blueprint for that is an activity um, that was also from, I guess, two yeah, almost two years ago now, that we did with uh, Academy for Public Health in Germany. So they had this problem that they have uh, had uh, the whole digital transformation of their learning resources still ahead of them. So they worked with printed books that were only available as printed books uh, in all of their classes. And this is important what they do because they, they do this kind of training where you have um, uh, medical doctors who specialized or specialize on working in public health um, authorities, right? 
and um, so the, their their idea was okay we want to move on with minimal resources we only have so much money from uh, the Min federal ministry of health and we also have limited time but we want to be successful quickly with that transformation of our resources so and they turned to uh, wikimedia germany and then they turned uh, so, so they were <laughs> forwarded our direction somehow and uh, then uh, we came up this with this idea to have a marathon of sprint events on their main topics so we invited experts that uh, in the past already uh, did the teaching and training for them we invited them and and we gave them even a little bit of money to compensate for for all the things that we expected for, from them um, and we invited them to uh, come to the place of the academy for three or four days each or so and uh, you find the result also on the TIB website uh, at the tib.eu slash books site so and uh, this really worked super well and, and so so in, in the beginning we we we, we made this um, um, experience uh, and it, it boils down to to one thing you need um a product owner to talk like an agile whatever um you need you need someone who feels the responsibility of having these educational resources and it, it's completely i mean it is not important from which area they are but they must uh, own this right and then you are or we are maybe in the role of a facilitator who helps them who consults with them from the very start so how do we find the experts how do we convince them to contribute to the project and and in the end it will be an open project and there's shared responsibility there's collective ownership all of this and and we expect them to come and to create something in just three days how will this work so you have a lot of things that you will have to convince the experts and you need the product owner on your side so you have to convince them first of the, or it, somehow they, 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 they must really com commit to this goal and then again they must commit to this goal, but the, the upside that you have always is that it does not take much money and time. I mean, once they are convinced to, to try it this way, you can really do it together. And then uh, you have, and let, let me say one last anecdote and, and I will finish my answer. And that was maybe one of the most surprising things that I learned during all of this was after the end of the second or so, I guess, sprint event with the people from the academy. The medical doctor who was the head of their learning department told, told me, um, Lambert, it's, it's really very nice that you want to come to the next sprint event and help us as well. But by now we know how this works. You, it's nice, you can come, but, but you don't need to. And this is something that I really did not intend it and did not expect, but just by being part of that event, they learned everything that was necessary. There's open source software that they can just use. We, we customized it a little, little bit for them. There was a little bit of effort uh, into this by my colleague Simon Worthington here at TRB. But in the end, they owned the method. And this is, I'm, I, this can be hardly overstated how important this is. Um, yeah. Sorry for the lengthy answer. So I'm just wondering, Lambert, just uh, sorry to come back. So who are, who are our future product owners then? So who are the, the people who are going to get excited by this and who want to take it forward? Have you got any themes or any thoughts? I mean, I'm sure there are other people in the room who have thoughts or well, we can still think about it in the future. But is there something where you think, oh, I think this would be exciting to look at this theme. Is there something that you need or where you, you or perhaps you know of a champion who could be a product owner? Super interesting question again. Um, yeah, maybe one anecdote about this. So um, one year ago, so I was invited by Wiley, by the publisher and their textbook division. And they invited me to tell us about the approach. And I was thinking like, okay, hmm, they invite me. Okay, I will directly address them and tell them, okay, 
ultimately we will put you out of business <laughs> we, 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 because we, we, we teach people how, how, uh, how they do not need this traditional process of having um, uh, someone who owns the publishing machinery and who owns the end product and so on, right? And uh, they were very friendly and it was an interesting event. And reflecting after this event, um, I was thinking, okay, but maybe uh, these people also have something that we need to learn, right? Because, I mean, th th there are several aspects to it. One thing is for sure, Wiley is a um, brand, and this has brand value. So if you have a textbook, and you can add to your CV, oh, I published a textbook at Wiley or so, this seems to speak by for itself. And this is in many ways problematic and we can discuss at length about this, but it, it worked like this in our world today. So, and one other aspect is that there's some way of entrepreneurial thinking on their side. And this is something that is interesting and has also positive aspects, right? So I, I guess as a manager at Wiley textbook division, you look at the world and wonder, okay, where, where's, where's the opportunity there? What, 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 what will be the next textbook? Because knowledge is developing so rapidly now and there are at all of the time, there are new fields that need explanation and cross disciplinary fields and so on and different audience levels and everything, yeah? And national markets that have their, their, their uh, unique things. So, and you uh, probably, probably, but this is just in a guess. We need a little bit to learn from them and have this entrepreneurial thinking where we think, okay, where, where is where, these approaches that we are sure about that we have them like openness, open educational resources, open uh, production processes, open source software that is involved and so on. Mm, uh, where are people who, who are our future um, uh, product owners who, who will make use of this, right? So I love that uh, thought also about being more entrepreneurial. Not sure whether we need the publishers for that, but certainly we could, you know, take that thinking forward. I think for me, bringing together the open science uh, colleagues with the open education ones in a hackathon would be a brilliant um, start. And we could bring other people into that, but, you know, just, actively bringing those people around the table to do something together uh, could be something. And you just talked about this textbook uh, with Wiley. We could also create a textbook uh, or uh, somebody from a, another domain uh, with colleagues might want to create a textbook. And I know Amsterdam has some very good um, guidance on how to how to write textbooks, but you know, perhaps a uh, book sprint or anyway, I'm really excited by this. And I know I know there's something exciting that we can do with this. And, and I'm very grateful for you sharing. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I, th 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 thank you, Vanessa. And uh, I, I, I feel like I'm super sure that I can learn a lot from the Amsterdam colleagues because they have this playbook of creating real textbooks at scale. And this is some, so, so, so maybe our approaches fit in something with their approach because we, we focus on certain processes like the book sprint itself and so on. But in general, uh, textbooks, uh, this is huge. And, and we are only, as, as you all know, at the very beginning with making them open, right? And uh, it's, it's a f f fascinating strategic questions also, also, yeah. Paula, you raise your hand. <laughs> yes. First of all, thank you. Thank you very much for all the knowledge you shared with us today. And uh, about uh, the textbooks, uh, uh, I know that uh, together with Silvia, uh, we are going to organize something with you in the next uh, months and involve uh, uh, all the members in this room and also the annual members who are not here today. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question in relation to uh, quality, because usually when th something is developed very quickly, and this is not my personal view on this, but uh, something that uh, I see as an issue to be faced in order to convince people about the outcome. Uh, 
first of all, well, maybe it's a couple of questions. One is uh, uh, in relation to what is considered the, the quality, the acceptable quality level of the outcome in this case. Another, another question, and uh, this enlarges the field quite largely, I think, is that uh, according to what you said about the intangible side of these events, if uh, quality is connected uh, on the outcome, the tangible out outcomes, or if it is also considered part of the intangible experience. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is super interesting. Again, um, quality. Yeah, yeah. So, so as you know, with hackathons, it's easy because uh, hackathons make just this claim: okay, you have um, this certain level of technology readiness or whatever you name it that we target on and it just needs to be a prototype where you get the idea so but with books it's a little bit different right and it's uh, so, so, so um, it's really interesting to to get this right to to target at the right uh, level so to say uh, so um, to set your target right and um, from my experience um, you must make sure that you do not misunderstand what is being done in a book sprint for a textbook or manual or guide or handbook, as I like to put it. So if you have original research in mind, for instance, like you want to find something really new, maybe across the borders of different fields that do not have maybe enough uh, have not been in touch with each other or so. Um, a book sprint, as I would facilitate it, is not the right way to do it. Because so, so a book sprint always assumes that there is already a virtual common knowledge in place, but it's just by now, it's just in the head of these experts. And then you help them to scrape it out of their heads and put it on paper, so to say. Yeah, really, really, that's, this is how I imagine it. And, and um, then when, when you have this situation, so there is this vir virtual um, specialized common knowledge already there, then you have book sprint as a method. And then still you need to uh, cut it down to a piece that is manageable within a, a few days, right? And then you still have to cut it a little bit down. So, so one helpful um, question to ask is, what is necessary that the manuscript at the end of these days stands on its own feet and doesn't need additional meta text to explain what this is? If you reach this goal, you have you, you have done a great effort because then you can go on and ask, for instance, for specialized um, editorial workers to help you with the text. So, for instance, they make sure that you uh, always have the same vocabulary if you talk about the same thing, that you get the references right, that you... You get, you get my point, right? So, and, um, or, or you maybe can have even a high level review from the outside. This is also possible. But in order to get this, the text on the topics that you choose with the uh, boundaries that you choose to have um, must be complete and must be completely understandable on its own. This is, this is um, uh, a practical, a good goal for a book sprint from my experience, which is limited, of course. I did so many book sprints, but there are other experts outside. So this is only, but, but, but uh, book sprints sometimes, uh, this is also about the question with, uh, why not do this with students or so. Um, running book sprints is a little bit like um, baking recipes from my experience. If you never did a, a, a cake on your own, you can still try to improvise and, oh, wow, I have flour, I have a little bit sugar and eggs, and put them somehow together. It will be not very delightful what comes out of it. In order to have a really good cake, you have at least follow the baking recipes for maybe two or three times or so. And then, then you can start to improvise and, ah, okay, I, I know how this works with the, with the mixture of flour and uh, butter and so on. And you can uh, create your own thing, but first you have to learn and apply um, this um, knowledge that others are already prepared for you. Sorry. Thank you very much. 
I think we have uh, one more question for Marta. Is there still time, Paola? Yes. <laughs> I have a really practical question, <laughs> which is always what I like. Um, so say, for instance, with the book sprints, I'm assuming that you have a platform where the books go, which is uh, certainly in the Irish context, that's, that's the problem. But OK, so let's assume you have the platform. How do you go about promoting this stuff? so that it doesn't just sit there like on a dusty shelf? This is a very good question, actually, yeah, yeah. So what we have, and this is mostly uh, being developed and maintained by my dear colleague, Simon Worthington here at uh, TIP Open Science Lab, is a thing where you have, um, it's based on the software Fidos Writer, you can all look this up on, on TIB website, um, where you can collaboratively write um, the manuscript in chapters with reference management and such. And then you um, push it to a Git repository. Uh, to, this is our assumption. We can discuss about this at length, but it feels like um, after a few years of experience with these kinds of things or so, that the future of... of, of um, um, conveying published material is maybe pretty close to how we handle uh, software, open source software in particular. So you have a Git repo where you have the structured book content, and then you can easily change it to different output formats with the hit of a button. You have a nice PDF, but you also have a browser-based book stuff like this and um yeah and then comes a really interesting part okay you have all of these uh, uh almost effortless nice uh, formatted versions of your book you have it openly licensed and so on but what about the readers <laughs> so how does it end up under the christmas tree of your reader right so and uh, the only thing that i can say by now from our experiences is to work with people who are already in the business of explaining their knowledge to others, right? So if you have people who do trainings, who teach at a university, who, you name it, yeah, um, they are um, the ones you turn to and they, they will help you. And they will help you to find also to find ways to, to um, um, do this. But what we, lack, what we are lacking is uh, we, we are not widely textbooks, right? Yes. And, and and this is uh, this is interesting, right? And and we we must be very clear about this. So with Wiley, you you can have a book that is maybe not that well prepared actually, but you put it on a shelf, and there you have the new Wiley book on X that Y whatever, and um, this is makes still the difference, I guess. Yeah, I was thinking about it in terms of the you know the attention economy there's so much out there and we're creating more and more all the time and the more we create the less time people have to look at it so i think creating open educational resources and open books is fantastic but it has to be done in in such a way that you almost have a communications plan from the way from the get go to know how to promote this to the right audiences, to the people who will be interested in using it. And that's what I find the hard bit. Absolutely, you name it, yeah. M maybe it's, it's good to have leading experts from the field, field who put their names behind it, because this is what, yeah. what uh, traditional textbooks, how they work as well, right? This is also part of their marketing. So you have the important yeah. names. And if they tell their audience, okay, now look here we, we we have it now in the open and it has by the way additional benefits like we can update it more quickly and stuff um this will help i guess <laughs> yes pablo raised you raised your hand yes i had a, a relatively short question because in my practice, I'm actually using open access uh, textbooks uh, quite widely, and that is in two, uh, in two instances uh, for two courses. And I understand it is uh, like uh, 
like somebody who's actually done both teaching and creating a course based on a textbook. And my suggestion would be maybe to use already existing version, maybe international or American version, and then creating a local European uh, version of that, let's say for a course in introduction to sociology, we've been using a Canadian version, which I thought was more international. I had more content, extra things. And I think that uh, could be something uh, to consider in other areas as well, where you would have uh, a core a version which is high quality already it was uh, an open stacks project and then you could do maybe a translation into german or french or whatever i was not spanish it seems let's say if you think about an intercourse it could be easier than to do something from scratch while adapting the content to local realities uh, local news items or uh, whatever um, mm -hmm. uh, imagery on the one hand, and then I think if it is a newly done textbook, let's say uh, for a course, adoption is usually dependent on question banks. In other words, if you use uh, multiple choice questions uh, to do, uh, let's say, uh, um, three midterm quizzes and then one end of term, end of uh, term uh, exam, then you will have to have um, quiz banks. And it is something I've been struggling with uh, for a case where I on a textbook of high quality, and then I didn't have any uh, type of question banks uh, to integrate into a course. So once again, it depends on the methodology uh, used in the classroom, but then, uh, but then if it is uh, something more American style, or let's say, uh, if you want to have an online course done from end to end, uh, in a, a certain way, let's say in Europe, it could be something more more intensively done by an instructor, maybe with the essays instead of the quizzes or exams, which are done on a multiple choice basis. Uh, once again, uh, and that might depend on how long the course is. If it is eight weeks, uh, 16 weeks, etc. In other words, it would also uh, depend. Uh, but I think at, um, creating local versions could be something uh, uh, which would be amenable to sprints uh, like what you actually described. And then on the, on another note, uh, I was, since I come uh, from a background in open access uh, and understand how it might work on the model side, let's say, and then I think uh, maybe uh, crowdfunding could be something to look into if somebody wants uh, to actually create uh, a team have uh, certain tasks uh, and do it on a sustainable basis where, in other words, uh, based on the news I've seen uh, throughout uh, in recent years, it was usually funding which would make possible a high quality book being done in a certain field. It, it usually won't happen on a long team basis. In other words, it is a great idea and I've seen initiatives uh, like that. Uh, once again, internationally in Canada, maybe US, uh, once again, uh, less US, uh, more Canada, maybe Europe as well. Uh, so where people would try to, uh, to do a crowd uh, source effort, not crowdfunding, but crowdsource. But then if we look at outcomes, which is a different thing, then maybe crowdfunding, or let's say third party funding, it could be actually um, uh, a critical uh, precondition for that actually happening, anything you could tell us, uh, or you already told us that it won't happen otherwise. In other words, intentions are good, but then if you want outcomes which are high quality and actually uh, would work across areas, in, uh, across courses, which are not necessarily introductory level courses, in other words, if it is a, um, let's say a chemistry course or some sort of whatever, then you would have to have a, a really concerted effort to, to get expertise, to get a team and an outcome as well in open access, of course. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I, I have to um, uh, ask for a very short answer because we're running out of time. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, thanks, thanks for the input, Pablo. Mm -hmm. This is uh, super important to consider, and uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm totally unsure about this. So, so from my perspective, one maybe let me mention one aspect. Um, 
it might be interesting to adopt this pattern from which you have also an open source software development or so that you start very small and uh, incrementally um, grow the project in size. Um, I mean, it must not always fit the bill, but uh, sometimes it's worth to to start uh, with a very small minimal budget and just prove that you can have it. And uh, um, but 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 uh, yeah, as, as you mentioned, it, uh, at some point, yeah, you you need to consider a few economic things as well. Uh, you are right about this, sure. And also scale at this level where you have, this is typical for OER in general, I guess, where you have national demands and different audience groups. And this gets so messy, right? Because there are really huge differences. Yeah, yeah it, is, it is obvious we don't have a simple task here. No. Um, but thank you, uh, Lambert, for uh, your energy and your enthusiasm and your cool things. <laughs> My um, pleasure. <laughs> thank you for having me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you were the first man, and uh, um, I think, <laughs> yeah, because the other uh, three were women, and uh, the next time we will uh, also have a woman. But uh, thanks again, and uh, yeah, a lot to think about. Um, and the next under the spotlight will be Nicole. She's also German speaking. She's from uh, Switzerland. So we're looking forward to this too. And uh, yeah, we, we have to think two months <laughs> about your uh, book springs and uh, hackathons. Who knows? <laughs> Let me know if, if there's any yeah. question left. And yeah, we, <laughs> we have the university yeah. press uh, open. So uh, I'll um, uh, uh, pass on the idea. Okay, and, and, and we will keep in touch. <laughs>